Dear Mr. President, I am deeply honored to have been asked for my advice as you assume the awesome burdens of your new office. I can offer several rules of thumb, which I believe time and experience have proven sound. Act boldly in the beginning. The public has a short attention span, and it will make them forget the accomplishments of your predecessor and impress them with your vigor. Make your first priority the protection of your power. Without it, you are useless. Appear steadfast, but be flexible. Remember, some of God's greatest gifts are broken campaign promises. A playful paraphrase of words written in the year 1513 by a cashiered civil servant in Florence, Italy. What he actually wrote became one of the most hotly debated, deeply disturbing and important books of Western civilization. To some, it was a veritable guidebook for tyrants and totalitarians. Mussolini loved it. Marxists recognized a fellow revolutionary. To others, it paved the way for ethnic and religious toleration, individual rights and modern democracies. But, fairly or unfairly, it has caused his name, Machiavelli, to ring through the centuries as a synonym for evil. compare fortune to one of those violent rivers which, when they are enraged, flood the plains, tear down trees and buildings. Everyone flees before them. Everybody yields to their impetus. There is no possibility of resistance. Yet although such is their nature, one may still take precautions when they are flowing quietly building dams and dikes to control them in flood time. So it is with fortune. Rivers are not to be trusted. Neither are men. But both can often be controlled, given intelligence and power, and the willingness to get your hands dirty. Machiavelli is the first political thinker of the Christian era who systematically analyzed the requirements of power and survival. The Prince is a book about power. Political power at a time of city-states or principalities, ruled by men called princes. It amounts to 26 short chapters of analysis and opinion that range from the classification of government to advice on selecting staff. It was written to shock and re-educate its reader, and it still manages to do so to challenge the political pieties of its day and explain to princes and prince wannabes how the game is really played. It tells the prince that before anything else, he must know how to fight. He must learn to be ruthless and cruel, to lie, break his word, and be ready to violate both morals and religious principles when needed. Though it also stresses the need to appear compassionate, moral, and devout, some say Machiavelli invented modern politics. And when we read The Prince, we can see today's headlines. I think in many ways that it's a great book because it is a mirror for Machiavelli's own time and because it does continue to disturb, provoke, and make us think anew and see in what way it does relate to our own time. And we keep asking questions of it. It was Machiavelli who said... Get real. In Italian, of course. A multi sono immaginati repubbliche e principali. Many have dreamed up republics and principalities which have never in truth existed. The gap between how one should live and how one does live is so wide that a man who neglects what is actually done for what should be done is on the way to self-destruction. Machiavelli's focus on what is actually done is in tune with his times. Copernicus is studying the heavens. 
and Leonardo is dissecting cadavers, both trying to learn how God actually did it, to learn not from theory, but direct observation. Just as Leonardo was interested in anatomizing the world of nature, so Machiavelli, in a sense, was interested in anatomizing the world of politics and the world of history. But dissections and autopsies are never pretty. One of the uglier discoveries attributed to Machiavelli is the idea that the end justifies the means. Now, he didn't put it quite that way. In the actions of all men, and especially of princes, where there is no court of appeal, one judges by the result. Machiavelli is very clear that the end is what counts. He says this in a number of places, and it seems to us a very tough argument. There are some situations in which the more the survival is threatened, the narrower the margin of choice becomes, unless you say you would rather have your society destroyed than to pursue a marginal means. What would you do to prevent this from happening to your people? What would you not do? Would you lie? Violate treaties? Assassinate people? Just where would you draw the line? Anywhere? On the other hand, if you are winning a war and your enemy is all but finished, how far would you go to minimize your own casualties? Machiavelli was acquainted with the moral ambiguities of power. He was a realist. Machiavelli pursued what some scholars have called amoral realism. First of all, what he was trying to do was create something that didn't exist up to that point, uh, the nation state, in this case, Italy. But what we need to ask ourselves is whether we really are in desperate straits, whether we really are up against the hard laws of necessity that Machiavelli is describing. I think much of the time we assume we are and are not. Like politicians today, Machiavelli justifies harsh or deceitful means as necessary to the common good. But his focus is on the presence or absence of power. What is it? How do you get it? How do you keep it? Good questions in any age, but stark and immediate in Machiavelli's. When I came to this interview, I left my home in Vermont as an isolated individual, drove a car to Boston, took an airplane to New York, came to this interview without people around me. I was safe. In the Middle Ages, human beings were not able to move from one place to another without having other people around them who could protect them. Florence, fabulous window on the past. Down these same streets walked the monks, soldiers, and merchant princes of Machiavelli's time as well as artists whose names and work are today as famous as his. We are now in the age of Michelangelo, Leonardo, Columbus and Copernicus, of England's Henry VIII, and of Germany's Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. It is a turbulent time of conflict and contradiction. New ideas and new technologies are rocking Europe like a great earthquake. The medieval system is collapsing, and the idea that man is master of his fate is just beginning to take root. It is the Renaissance, the April of Western civilization, and the concept of government as a purely human invention is one of its flowers. But April is a cruel month. Giuliano de' Medici, murdered in the great cathedral by a rival family, 
the Pazzi. It was a plot blessed by the sitting Pope to overthrow the de facto rule of the Medici in Florence. Such were the times. Politics was a family matter. Medici retribution was swift and brutal. Several conspirators, including an archbishop, were slaughtered where they were caught and their bodies hung from the windows of City Hall. The last one sketched as it hung by Leonardo da Vinci. Religion, too, seemed often a kind of family affair. Princes of the church had concubines. Popes had children. Lucretia and Cesare Borgia, brother and sister and lovers, also had wealth and power thanks to their sire, Pope Alexander VI, who gives the term godfather a whole other meaning. Italy was an anarchy of city-states, popes and other princes in constantly shifting alliances, murders in the cathedral and orgies in the Vatican were the debris of a crumbling medieval order. This was the world of Niccolo Machiavelli. The separation of politics and religion was to become for him a major theme. Getting religion out of politics was an idea with legs. Its mirror image would appear in America, whose founding fathers were trying to get politics out of religion. They would write it into their constitution as the separation of church and state. We have not seen the end of controversies ignited by that idea, and it does have a dark side. That separation between ethics and politics, the belief that the good prince is not necessarily the good man, that appearance matters more than reality, that deception can be practiced, that it is better to be feared than loved. All those famous conclusions of the prince are ones that have eternally struck people as the most difficult and, and indeed painful question about politics, and they don't want to confront it. They don't want to believe that someone thought those things. Was the man who did think those things a Christian, a pagan, an atheist? Machiavelli was a Sunday Christian. He did not dispute the essential dogmas of the Catholic faith. He simply put them to one side when he came to think and talk about politics at all. If Machiavelli's print seems to have a lot of moral leeway, the price for that is fairly steep. He must love his country more than his soul. He must be prepared to go to hell for it. To kill a man is still to kill a man. And a prince has to, has to, be, has to be ready to do it. He has to be ready to go to hell. Being in charge, being a ruler, being a, being a prince is intrinsically a tragic job and without redemption and uh, without justification. Machiavelli found it possible to live with contradictory views and therefore not to see himself as he came very quickly to be seen as anti-Christian or anything of the kind. Some think I should teach men the way to heaven, but I would rather teach them the way to hell so they'll know how to go around it. The Medici were exiled in 1494 when Charles VIII of France rode unopposed into Florence on his way to other conquests. Niccolo Machiavelli was 27. The city, long a republic in name, became again a republic in fact. Its first leader was a fiery, puritanical, but very popular monk named Savonarola, who denounced the corruption of the church and was responsible for two of history's more notable bonfires. On one, Savonarola burned books and artworks. On the other, the church burned Savonarola. The spot is marked today in front of City Hall, where a few weeks later, Niccolo went to work for the Republican government of Piero Sodorini. Machiavelli worked for the committee that was in charge of defense and foreign affairs. 
He took care of the needs of the military, and he went on special missions to foreign courts. And then he was all throughout uh, Italy. He met uh, many lords and rulers, and naturally among them is Cesare Borgia. Borgia is a legend in his own time of ruthlessness and depravity. In one instance, Borgia invites his enemies to peace talks and has them all killed. That was the uh, main uh, impression that he got from, uh, from uh, uh, Borgia, this cold blood and this capacity of uh, using violence, let's say, well, crudeltà bene usata, that is for a very lucid political uh, goal, uh, not just a display of power, but in a very functional, uh, functional uh, way. When he returns from these missions, a doting but impatient staff confronts him with a mountain of domestic details and problems. But Niccolò has weightier things on his mind. He is a visionary an Italian patriot convinced that only a single forceful leader can unify Italy, and he knows that independence will require a citizen army. Machiavelli believed that the mercenary armies that characterized the military system of Renaissance Italy, and indeed of much of Europe, were a terrible mistake, that the Romans had used civic militias, that every state should use its own citizens, that only in this way could you get the commitment and ethos of civilians to express its, themselves in the defense of the state and that that would have very good results in terms of the internal laws, institutions, and, and ethos of the state as well. Machiavelli sells the idea, and in a war with neighboring Pisa, his citizen soldiers perform moderately well. But in 1512, they meet hardened Spanish troops at a town named Prado. The Spanish mercenaries panic Machiavelli's militia, and a ghastly slaughter follows. In the wake of this rout, the Medici return to end the Soderini Republic, and with it, Machiavelli's political career. In Niccolo's view, the feckless Soderini could have squashed the Medici return had he been sufficiently ruthless. Leadership requires more than plans and policies. In order to maintain his state, a prince is often forced to act in defiance of good faith, of charity, of kindness, of religion. He should not deviate from what is good if that is possible, but he should know how to do evil if that is necessary. The notion that necessity could justify behavior which was not otherwise virtuous or moral was actually accepted by almost all of the ancient thinkers. Lincoln's critics in his day uh, thought he was a dictator, thought he was a tyrant, uh, thought he was undemocratic, uh, thought in spite of all the folksy backwoods charm uh, that he, he was an egomaniac and was operating unconstitutionally much of the time. In the case of, for example, the suspension of habeas corpus, he probably was. Um, and, and this is a, perhaps a great uh, example of Machiavellian leadership in a democracy. There is a physics of politics, and sooner or later, every leader discovers for himself the laws of relativity and uncertainty also known as the law of unintended consequences. Taking everything into account, he will find that some of the things that appear to be virtues will, if he practices them, ruin him. And some of the things that appear to be vices will bring him security and prosperity. Messeri, ci hanno dato la lista di Caponi. The reinstalled Medici have discovered a plot to overthrow them, and they have a list of people the plotters hope to recruit. The seventh name on the list 
is Niccolò Machiavelli. The plotters never got to Machiavelli. It doesn't matter. He's a suspect and the Medici don't need much excuse to throw him into prison. It is a prayer chanted by priests for those about to die. This chanting is for the list makers. Prison here has two functions, execution and interrogation. Interrogation means torture, quite legal and quite ingenious. What awaits Niccolo is the strapado, hands tied behind the back, hoisted by the wrists and dropped part way. If the drop is far enough, it will tear the shoulders out of their sockets. Niccolo's drop is obviously less severe, but it is torture, and he learns well the uses of pain. The bond of love is one that men break when it is to their advantage to do so, but fear is strengthened by a dread of punishment which never abandons you. For Niccolo, the experience of the past few months has not been conducive to a romantic view of life, but it has been instructive. In the spring of 1513, Giovanni de' Medici becomes Pope Leo X, and Machiavelli is released in a general amnesty, but with restrictions. He is restricted to the region around Florence, barred from the city hall, banned from politics. He moves to the family's property a few miles out of the city. There he is free, in his own kind of hell, an addict cut off from his source. Only someone who's been there can know the pain. Gary Hart was the prince presumptive of the Democratic Party before fortune and his own indiscretion cut him off. In many ways, hell is being possessing a talent which one cannot use. And this was Machiavelli's hell. And a profound one for him, because he understood how talented he was and how visionary he was. And I think it must have been desperately hard for him, as it would be, for example, for a politician today who had both the talent and, here's the crucial element, a monolithic dependence on the addiction of participation. Uh, speaking only for myself, I tried desperately and with some success not to become so dependent on politics or on the adrenaline of participation that I couldn't do without it. In a letter to a friend, Niccolo describes the narrow confines of his current life, supervising work on his property and killing time with the locals in the local inn. With these, I sink into vulgarity for the whole day, playing at cards, and these games bring on a thousand disputes with the countless insults, and usually we are fighting over a penny. So involved in these trifles, I keep my brain from growing moldy. The personal Machiavelli seems entirely human. He is compassionate, witty, and profane, even sometimes obscene. He is married, but he is attracted to other women, and they to him. Machiavelli was a great guy. He was friendly, affable, loyal to his friends. He loved to go out drinking. He loved women. He loved good conversation. Uh, just an ordinary, nice guy. Well, ordinary may not be the best word, but certainly Machiavelli seems anything but Machiavellian. He is personable. He is also a very talented guy. He wrote the best, the best comedy of our literature, La Mandragola, in 1518. And, uh, okay, there is a comedy with the bitter and even the somber uh, undertones, but it's a lively uh, uh, play, wonderful. 
On the coming of evening, I return to my house and enter my study. And at the door, I take off the day's clothing covered with mud and dust and put on garments regal and courtly and reclothed appropriately. I enter the ancient courts of ancient men where, received by them with affection, I feed on that food which is mine and which I was born for. Niccolo begins to work on what he calls the Discourses on the First Ten Books of Titus Livy. It is a book of commentaries on the work of that Roman historian and makes a strong case for a republican form of government. Then all of a sudden, he decides to try to get back into the government himself and writes in furious time, in three months' time, The Prince. He interrupts the writing of the discourses to take off this time to write The Prince because he's anxious to get back into politics, into, into government life. Are there two Machiavellis here? One writing a book on the Republican form of government and the other, almost simultaneously, writing advice for tyrants. I look at Machiavelli's Prince as a work on statesmanship and the discourses as a statement of desirable objectives. And so I don't find the two incompatible with each other. Politics was his consuming interest, and if he could have made the world the way he wanted it to be, he would have preferred a republic but he could live with both republics and with principalities and his point was that you begin from where you are and that you judge any form of government by its outcome rather than simply by its form. All the states, all the dominions under whose authority men have lived in the past and live now are either republics or principalities. Principalities are either heretical. So begins the most famous job application in history. It joins Niccolo's passion for a united Italy with the fact of Medici rule. It urges the reigning Medici to take on a new role as nation founder. Niccolo offers a blueprint for a new kind of leader. So, who is this ideal prince? What are his qualities? Roughly that combination of strength of character, intelligence, courage, skill, and luck which astronauts call the right stuff, plus a touch of ruthlessness. Machiavelli stressed two sets of attributes for the prince. One um, was very colorful. He used the image of the, of the fox and the lion. The prince must have the ability of the fox to find the snare and the courage of the lion to drive off the wolves. At certain particular moments, which he calls the founding or refounding of a regime, you will need a leader with exceptional intelligence, with the intelligence of a Lincoln, with the intelligence of a Washington, with the intelligence of a Bonaparte. Machiavelli's breakthrough is that he gives us the persona, the personality of the political realist. He gives us uh, the, the inner discipline of the strategist. And this is a discipline that involves uh, a great deal of self-control, such that uh, one cannot revel in conquest, uh, one can uh, not strike out impulsively, uh, one has to be constantly scrutinizing one's own motives, one must constantly uh, attend to others carefully, even civilly, uh, lest uh, you give away your own hand, uh, and while you're trying to discern the, the, uh, their own missteps or their own deceptions. And so what we get is someone who's not quite a Christian knight, but is nonetheless often very well behaved. He also gives us the political actor. The prince may or may not keep his word, may or may not be humane, devout, a man's man, a family man, depending on the circumstances. But he must appear to be all of those things. Men in general judge by their eyes rather than by their hands because everyone is in a position to watch. Few are in a position to come in close touch with you. Everyone sees what you appear to be. Few experience what you really are. And so there is a larger sense in which the prince is playing a role, which is to appear to be the things he knows he must not necessarily be. 
and to appear to act on principle when what he's acting on is calculation or what the modern world would refer to as long-term strategy because in a certain way Machiavelli invented the very notion of a long-term strategy. Stay focused. Talk about things that matter to people. You know? It's the economy, stupid. Okay? So, as we always say, you know, speed kills. And, and we will die in this debate if we're not there first with our answers. Uh, Bush was on the defensive... But perhaps most important, Machiavelli's prince is a political artist. He sees the prince as somebody who takes matter as though it were marble and imposes a form on it as though that person were a sculptor. Form out of stone. Order out of chaos. Civilization from savagery. Michelangelo and Machiavelli's prince have much in common. Trouble is, raw material for the prince is human flesh and blood. For that, the prince must learn how and when to be cruel. And he must have studied war. The main foundations of every state are good laws and good arms. And because you cannot have good laws without good arms, and where there are good arms, good laws inevitably follow, I shall not discuss laws, but give my attention to arms. The sentence is one of the most marvelous puzzles in all of Machiavelli. You need good arms. Good arms are the arms of a citizen army, not a mercenary army. How do you get the citizens to serve in the army? They have to think that the society meets their own private self-interest. So you need to have a republic in order to have a citizen army. You need to have good laws to have a republic. You are bound to meet misfortune if you are unarmed, because, among other reasons, people despise you. And this is one of the infamies a prince should be on his guard against. There is simply no comparison between a man who is armed and one who is not. Well, he's right on the money there. Machiavelli, I think, is most useful, in my judgment, uh, when you're thinking about international relations rather than the government within a state or a city. International relations are different from internal matters for one reason, because there is no law between nations. In reality, there, you really do have a jungle out there. And that's different from states, where you do have a law which has legitimacy and which uh, monopolizes force in the hands of the government. Uh, well, the, the world out there isn't like that. And we, we in the world today, in the West, in the United States, we hate that idea. It makes us very unhappy and very uncomfortable, and we refuse to believe it much of the time. And so this is where Machiavelli is most valuable in reminding us of those gross realities which haven't changed. You've got to have that power. No government should ever imagine that it can always adopt a safe course. This is the way things are. Whenever one tries to escape one danger, one runs into another. Prudence consists in being able to assess the nature of a particular threat and in accepting the lesser evil. Making careful judgments, that's prudence, as uh, Machiavelli says, and that's what we hire our government for. So in the end, Machiavelli also says that you shouldn't be over-cautious. You shouldn't be too prudent in that sense. You're going to have to take action. It's easy to think of a very immediate example of that in the case of Bosnia, where Bush, I, whom I think had the best chance of dealing with the problem and settling it, had from the beginning been willing to look at the reality, which is that we are not free to allow that sort of violence, that sort of, uh, um, what's the word I want to, the breaking of international uh, order uh, to happen in the middle of Europe. And I think we had a lot more leverage on our NATO allies in Europe than we were, for whatever reason, we were willing to exercise. And there was probably a failure of leadership on our part. There's no law of nature that says the United States has to be involved in every crisis. At the time we made the final decision, we probably had no alternative. But on the road to the final decision, we certainly did not apply Machiavelli's maxims. We never asked ourselves, what is our objective here? What is our interest here? What are the means available? What is the best thing that can happen? What is the worst thing that can happen? 
Has an American president ever applied that kind of analysis before committing the nation to some foreign involvement? I think Roosevelt did it in his own mind before he went into World War II. Roosevelt had the capability of doing it. Nixon uh, had a great capacity for that. Henry Kissinger has been called the American Machiavelli by admirers as well as critics. That would make Richard Nixon his prince, especially talented in foreign policy, often brilliant, incisive, but secretive and suspicious. Richard could have profited from Niccolo's advice on at least one score. A prince must watch that he does not become afraid of his own shadow. His behavior must be tempered by humanity and prudence so that excessive distrust does not make him unbearable. For more than a century, Americans enjoyed the advantage of isolation amid rich natural resources. They were the exception among nations, immune from Europe's Machiavellian virus, the politics of survival. Is that immunity gone now? We cannot afford the pure American exceptional approach indefinitely. Doesn't mean that every end justifies every, every means, but it means that the purity that we have tended to with some of our uh, academics and some of our leaders have insisted on will be much more difficult. We destabilized governments. We tried to assassinate foreign leaders. Uh, we did some things, I think, again, particularly in uh, singling out the Nixon administration, that were a violation of our principles, our ideals. I think we're suffering for that today. In the first 100 days, we will bring to the vote... While Machiavelli's real expertise seems to be foreign policy, some of his advice on domestic affairs also has resonance, at least for modern-day conservatives. A man should not be afraid of improving his possessions lest they be taken away from him, or another deterred by high taxes from starting a new business. But above all, a prince must avoid taking the property of others, because men sooner forget the death of their father than the loss of their inheritance. Seventh, require a three-fifths majority vote to pass a tax increase. On the other hand, his ideal prince does bear a resemblance to Lenin. Kill the old prince and his family, create new titles and powers, and give them to new men. He should make the poor rich and the rich poor, as David did when he became king. Machiavelli's advice seems so often to cut two or more ways. It is little wonder there is a score of differing interpretations of the prince. Take, for instance, the bit about fear and love. It is far better to be feared than loved if you cannot be both, but you must avoid being hated. Fear is useful. Hatred is counterproductive. Most corporate executives would agree with that. Strict adherence to Christian virtue is just out of place. And so the question he raises is part of the distinction. Uh, that he brings to the modern study of politics. The answer he gives is also particularly distinctive. It's an answer that ruthlessly discriminates between politics and everything else, that asserts the autonomy of the political in the manner in which all other human values can be reduced to the struggle for power and the provision or maintenance of order. A copy of The Prince was finally presented to a Medici, who gave no indication he ever read it. It would never be published in Machiavelli's lifetime. And when he died, he went to hell, sort of. The demonization of Machiavelli began very shortly after Machiavelli's death. And that came at a time when the crisis of the contesting religions was really kicking into full gear in the 1530s and 40s. And both sides saw a demon in Machiavelli. Poor Niccolo. Not only is he now a demon, but the Medici plague him even in hell. 
His ideas are said to have inspired the massacre of 50,000 French Protestants in 1572, while Catherine de' Medici was Queen of France. And Protestant England makes Niccolo its prime villain. There is the idea that everything that is base and Italian and Southern and Catholic is somehow Machiavellian. It is at that time, the time of Marlowe and Shakespeare, that this association with evilness becomes uh, apparent. They talk about Iago as being Machiavellian. They talk about Richard III as being Machiavellian. Then there's a kind of rehabilitation that takes place in the era of classical republicanism, including, including some of the classical republicanism of England, when people began to look at Machiavelli the Republican. The state of Machiavelli's soul is a good deal less important to us than the nature of his legacy, the uses to which his ideas have been put. In the 20th century, has seen him on the one hand as a precursor of autocratic or even totalitarian views of government, and on the other as a good Republican and a fine social scientist who helps us to understand how things work. Washington, Napoleon, Churchill, Lenin, intellectual children of the same father, how Machiavellian. Now, history can't tell us where Niccolo's soul ended up. But we do know that he believed in keeping up appearances and that his mortal remains were put in the Cathedral of Santa Croce, among other honored Florentines. We also know that his influence is far from dead. Machiavelli and the Prince seem very much in vogue today. For instance, a columnist for U.S. News and World Report used them to critique a president. And that same president quoted them to the Washington Post to support his policies. It must be considered that there is nothing more difficult to carry out, nor more doubtful of success, nor dangerous to handle than to initiate a new order of things. For the reformer has enemies in all those who profit from the old order, and only lukewarm defenders in those who... So Machiavelli freelances now as a White House advisor. There's more than metaphor here. If Machiavelli invented politics as we know them, Politics as we know them have given us back some latter day Machiavellis. Come out and ride Advisors, strategists, political realists, maybe not above a dirty trick or two, but only in the name of good, clean winning. And if Machiavelli seems to work for two very different systems, so can these guys. Niccolo is doing well today. While his former estate turns out a fine Chianti wine in his name, he has joined Attila the Hun in the ranks of big-name corporate advisors, and he has interests in a couple of games on the market, which more or less use his precepts. One of them gets the history a bit wrong, and it has a golden rule that might have come from the prince if Machiavelli had thought of it. Maybe all this is Niccolo's purgatory. Judgment of his legacy is still in dispute, and even his staunchest defenders will admit he had some, well, flaws. He sometimes got the history wrong, too. He raided history, I think, to produce the examples as he understood them to make the points that he wanted, rather than seeking to first discover what really happened. He was an, let's put it this way, he was not a producer of history, he was a consumer. I think that his assessment of human nature is one where anyone would agree that human nature is imperfect. But for Machiavelli, it's more than imperfect. It is never guided by a good motive. And that, I think, is, in fact, less realistic. Like many realists, he thought that reality was self-evident. And, uh, in fact, reality is the hardest thing to assess. Machiavelli lived when new ideas and technologies were changing forever the realities of power and the notions of government. 
So do we. And his advice to analyze carefully the requirements for success without losing the courage to act seems painfully relevant today. The other thing that is left is to is that it leaves us is to understand that once you you have to put that analysis in the service of some idea, which he did in the discourses, where he described his idea of republican uh, government. And I think the prince must be read in conjunction with the discourses, because they had two sides, what was to him the same coin, and that was an important insight. There are certain books which are sufficiently complicated that they have a message for different people in different times because somehow they've touched at an aspect of fundamental human experience. Plato's Republic is one example of that. Rousseau's Social Contract or Locke. Machiavelli's Prince is a book like that. It deals with an aspect of human life in a very profound way. The central aspect being the role of leaders and why leaders are necessary in any complicated human community. Gary Hart has written the book which he says Machiavelli might have written had he been an idealist. Hart sees important similarities between Niccolo's time and ours. I believe that we are living on the hinge of history, on the cusp of history, and it's, it happens no more frequently than every hundred years, sometimes every five hundred years. And we are so in the middle of this, symbolically new century, new millennium, really new economic age, information versus industry or, or machines, and a new, a new order in the world uh, to play, replace the old Cold War order. And what is important is that this country find a new prince, find a patriot who can help us define what the, the next era is. Some readers of The Prince smell brimstone in its pages. Others find it more like ammonia, repugnant but profoundly clarifying. In truth, much of what Machiavelli wrote merely described how things actually were done in his time. The second sense in which I think Machiavelli is to be disagreed with is in the fundamental conclusion that he reached about the possibility of divorcing political matters from ethical considerations. I don't think it can be done, in fact. It's quite apart from whether it ought to be done. Yet few with any experience today would deny that much of what he wrote seems merely the common sense of politics. There's another sense in which we say Machiavelli is giving us the common sense of politics, and we ought to be more suspicious of this usage. Uh, there all we're saying is that what he says is common sense because we're already imitating him. So, Mr. President, having described how things really work in this perilous world, let me close with a few additional words of caution. Choose the most brilliant advisors Tell them to speak to you candidly, and then be wary of their advice. When decision time comes, keep your own counsel. And never ever forget that you are in show business, that leadership is nine-tenths acting a role. Never step out of it in public. Don't, for God's sake, carry your own bags. Welcome to the top of the heap, and lots of luck. Your humble and admiring servant, Niccolo Machiavelli. P.S. Don't look to heaven for your reward.